you guys had a conversation with Chandra Wickrama Singh. And one of the things that I have been really fascinated about is exobiology, the idea of organic material being delivered to Earth from space. I've done a bit of research, but you know, it's very, very fascinating and love to dump, jump into it uh, more. Back in, oh gosh, when was this? I think this was in 2014. I wrote an article uh, about the, uh, I, some of the ideas of exobiology. And okay, 2014, so this is even six years ago. And I, just a little extract from, um, from this article. And I said, in the late 1970s, there emerged a compelling hypothesis regarding the emergence and evolution of life on Earth. Formulated by Fred Hoyle and Chandra Wickrama Singh, it proposed that life did not first begin on Earth, but originated in the astronomical realm and was delivered to Earth via celestial objects, primarily comets. This idea necessarily supposed the origin and existence of life, or at least the biochemical precursors to life, to be somewhere else in the universe. The term now used to designate, designate study of this scenario and all its ramifications is exobiology. To be sure, others had proposed theories promoting the extraterrestrial origins of life. In the 19th century, Kyle, I'm sure you will recall that Flammarion, Lord Kelvin, and Hermann von Helmholtz all suggested that terrestrial life was not a homegrown phenomenon, but originated outside the planet, elsewhere in the universe. At a meeting of the British Society for the Advancement of Science in 1871, Lord Kelvin speculated on the possibility that meteorites had brought life to Earth. In 1908, same year, of course, as Tunguska, the Swedish scientist Arrhenius wrote on the feasibility of life migrating through space. Arrhenius coined the term panspermia, which basically means seeds everywhere, to describe this process and is now considered the founding father of the field of exobiology. However, science at that stage of development was not capable of providing actual evidence that could confirm or refute the notion of a cosmic origin to life. So for most of the 20th century, nearly all scientists viewed the Earth as a closed system until the aforementioned revival by Ho Hoyle and Wickrama Singh. Since they first published, our understanding of cosmic processes has evolved. We now know that prebiotic material is exceedingly robust, making it more likely that it could survive an interplanetary or even interstellar journey. In 1986, a flyby of Halley's Comet detected the presence of organic materials. In 2004, a close flyby of Comet P slash Wild registered the spectral signature of organic material present in the dust being ejected from the cometary nucleus. Cosmic dust has been collected directly from the atmosphere, the comet from the atmosphere by airplanes and balloons. Samples captured at an altitude of about 25 miles showed the presence of biologically active materials of an indeterminate nature. An extremely important advance in evolving models of exobiological processes came with the fall to Earth and swift recovery of the Murchison meteorite in 1968. An analysis of meteoritic material revealed the presence of 74 amino acids, of which 55 had no known counterpart on Earth. This find confirms conclusively that prebiotic chemistry has an extraterrestrial existence, and there exists a mechanism for the delivery of this material to Earth. So now, from there, Let's talk about Wick Ramasing and your interview with him and his possible connection between 
microbial deliver of microbial material to earth and what's going on right now. Yeah. Well, we, we talked to, um, Dr. C as George Howard calls him. Uh, okay. we talked to him. Yeah. We talked to him for more than two hours and it was amazing, but there were, there were things that stood out to me. He gave us the whole, he, he gave us a, a, a rundown of the, of the timeline of, you know, the things that he's been working on. The first thing that I really found fascinating was the discovery of the absorption spectra in infrared light of interstellar dust mm -hmm. and that it's organic, like not mm -hmm. ice crystals and other simple silicates or whatever that they, that long had been thought, but that it actually is complex organic materials, you know, not maybe not necessarily uh, organisms, but that this, the absorption spectra shows complex, what he called complex organic particles. Uh -huh. Uh, so that was really interesting. And I mean, you know, that to me, so that means like these enormous interstellar dust clouds that are out there are made of complicated organic chemistry at the very least. So like what you were saying, like prebiotic mm -hmm. material. Um, so that was really interesting. And we talked about the, he talked about the various studies they did with balloons. Uh, first, there was a mountaintop study, and how many, how much biological material was hitting these mountains? Was it the Sierra Nevadas? Yeah, I can't remember. I think I think it was. Something like so that, that you know that 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 those mountain peaks are a certain amount high, and then he said that they were like forty one kilometers up with balloons, and they got. He was. I can't remember what was it. A million. What was the What was the numbers? Well, the. The amount of virus based based on the study at the on the mountaintops, the they had these basically collector plates. Yeah, and um, the uh, they figured the amount of viruses that fall on every square meter is one billion, basically one billion viral particles per day per day on every square every meter. Every square meter of the planet. <laughs> that and there's like, I'm not going outside anymore. Right. Yeah, it's outrageously <laughs> large. I remember that. Yeah. 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 And, uh, outrageously unexpectedly yeah, it's, large. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, he was saying three tons of biological material or the equivalent of, you know, uh, a bi almost a billion viral particles per square meter per, per 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. wait. What did you <laughs> Three three tons on every square meter. No, no, no. Every twenty four hours. I think the idea was three tons total. Yeah. Per day. Oh yeah. Okay. Over the yeah. over the whole planet. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that yeah. sounds reasonable. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. I was saying, if it's the latter, then that would explain why I've been kind of feeling kind of sluggish when I've been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Another well, way to say it. three tons of bacterial weight on my shoulders. I <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Another way he put it was was that they found that in every drop of ocean water, there's a million viruses, and most of which are not categorized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so and and the the, I, the fact is that the sun is constantly destroying these things, mm -hmm. and so they've got to be being regenerated or or how, how are something. they being replenished? How is every drop of ocean water contain a million viruses if the sun's destroying them all the time? It, well, yeah. what does Chandra say? He thinks they're, they're falling, infalling. They're falling. They're oh, infalling. okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Then right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so I asked him about, you know, I was like, well, okay. If the sun destroys them in our atmosphere and you know that we know that there's hard radiation out in space, you got alpha particle radiation plus gamma rays and stuff. How do they survive out there? And he said, well, they can be, you know, they can be preserved in these little tiny, uh, dust specks mm -hmm. and they're inside the dust specks. They're basically completely protected. But once they get down here, they, the, 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 the dust or whatever it dissolves in the water or falls apart in the atmosphere. And then the viruses, all the materials released into the atmosphere openly. And then, and then, you know, then they start infecting things or they get destroyed. So, uh, well, then go mention about his 79 or 77 book, which, you know, like I said, I read way back then loan my copy to somebody, which was a big mistake. I don't, <laughs> I don't loan books anymore. Um, yeah. But you know, the disease from space. I I uh, I don't recall a lot of detail about it. So he must have spoke about the idea of diseases from space and the current pandemic. Did he? Did that? Was yeah. that a? When did you guys have this conversation? Uh, it was like it was last Saturday. I yeah. Guess. Oh, okay. So that we were not, up, not we this. Were, yeah, a week ago. Yeah, yeah but we were this, still yeah, close enough ago. that we were into all of this at that point. Sure. Right. right. Yeah. And we did talk about he, you know, we went through some of the evidence that he put in the book about there's unexplained 
uh, spread of plagues in history, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How, how it would appear in various places like the one you talked about, you know, a lot was the, the Spanish influenza that showed up. It appeared on the same day in Bombay, in India, and in Boston in the United States. Yeah, how the on hell do the you same explain day. that? Right. And then it took, from Boston, it took three weeks to get to New York. So how did it show up in Bombay and in India, I mean, and in Boston on the same day? Exactly. Well, right. I have, I have a question here. Uh, why then, if, if given this idea that all this stuff is filtrating down from space, why do these, so many things, these things seem to vector back to Asia? Uh, well, we talked. We did talk some about that, and he talked about how there's there, there it's atmospheric stuff, and he showed um, how there's there's a latitude band that you can often see. So it comes in, and then there will be pockets where it is able to come down to the surface. But most of the time, he said, once they get into the atmosphere, they may stay there for years before they get down close enough to the surface where they start affecting things. And that's you know he that 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 has been shown by the balloon studies where you can they they're looking at stuff that's way up there. Uh, and it takes a long time for that stuff to percolate down to the to the lower levels of the atmosphere. But some places there are just holes where it can, like you know, the equivalent of a hole where it can fall to the surface. And then once it gets there, if it's infective on some some life there, then it will spread through regular you know medical vectors, basically. And, and it could be that, yeah, I mean, susceptibility to infection by the viruses may have a cultural component. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that uh, was sorry, Russ. That was that was episode one forty one for you guys, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, and it was excellent. And you know, I I learned so much, and I feel like I didn't even get half of it, and I need to go listen again. Oh well, so, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, everybody should go listen to the Brothers of the Serpent podcast number one forty one with Doctor Chandra Rick, Rick Ramasinga. Yeah. yeah, is that how you blew our the, minds? The sure. last part of his name is it actually like two syllables? Singa? Is that yeah? Singa. Yeah, we asked him. Singa. Yeah. Yeah, I asked him before Singa. we started to yeah. make. sure I was like, I want to yeah. make sure I'm saying. And he said, Wickramasinga is how he pronounced w- it. Yeah. Wickramasinga. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've a couple like other in, a, ahead, a couple sorry. other interesting points that he talked about. There's evidence of smallpox lesions on Egyptian mummies. I find this fascinating. Right. So I think this was in his Disease from Space book. Mm-hmm. Evidence of smallpox lesions on Egyptian mummies. So we're talking very old. And then, and then all through the classical period of Greece and everything, there's no evidence of smallpox, even though there's lots of records about diseases that were coming, you know, the Athenian plague, everything like that, but no smallpox. And then it suddenly reappears, and he, and he thinks that, that that shows that this may be a cyclical, a long cycle of something coming, coming in. Yeah. Now yeah. I would also like to point out that some of the critics to this idea – are saying, well, how come if, if let's say this COVID-19, and if it came from space, why is it so similar to these, this, these nine, there are 18 other strains or whatever of this, of, corona, of the, the yeah. coronavirus that are in these animals that are terrestrial. And the point is, is that if, if we live in this, like what Randall says often, this cosmic environment, and there is a, how, how did you put it? Um, the bio the, the biome. cosmic microbiome yeah, yeah cosmic microbiome and it's been raining down on us for billions of years so it would make sense that things coming from space today match things look very similar to things that are here because we are even we, we make our way around the galaxy this is another thing he pointed out what is it 250 million, million years. years we mm-hmm. we go all the way around the galaxy and if all the exoplanets in the galaxy are being occasionally bombarded by cometary objects, which also might be carrying biological precursors or whatever. But these planets that might have life on them, it's throwing all of that stuff into orbit and possibly escape velocity from their star systems. And so it's floating around in space. We eventually travel through it. So it's like the whole galaxy of exoplanets is, has been sharing this biological material for billions mm-hmm. of years. Mm-hmm. And that's just freaking yeah. out. I'm just like, that oh, was my really God. cool, yeah. So Earth has been doing this, too. Every time the Earth has been impacted, some material gets ejected all the way out into space, and some of it gets escape velocity from the sun, and that means that the biological material that was here at that time, at least the the microbiological stuff, some of it, will survive and And eventually seed other other exoplanets in the galaxy. That is really cool. Planetary (laughs) geologists have actually found fragments of Mars. 
on Earth. Right. Yeah. Fragments of Mars here. Yeah. So you've had the That's big awesome. impacts on Mars. It throws debris into space. Earth will sweep up some of that stuff. Right. Likewise, uh, debris from the moon. 